some rewrite at times without attribution the news stories of expensive and distinguished journalists who invested days, weeks or even months on their stories, all under the tattered veil of fair use. These people are not investing in journalism. They are feeding off the hard-earned efforts and investments of others. And their almost wholesale misappropriation of our stories is not fair use. To be impolite, it's theft. That was the News Corps' Rupert Murdoch, Harry Evans' former boss, and one of the world's most powerful media barons today, strongly criticizing, as you heard there, new media. Joining me again, Sir Harry Evans and Tina Brown. Do you agree? He said theft. I know. It's funny, because a day later, he, the Wall Street Journal, which he owns, took a big piece out of uh, something that I wrote and, you know, quoted it at exactly the kind of length that um, we do when we quote the Wall Street Journal. So I don't know. There's a little bit of overhype about theft in this sense. Uh, the Daily Beast, anyway, we link to people. I mean, we, we summarize and we link. And then we have 70% of it is our own uh, commission material, which is paid for content ourselves. So we're not the actual kind of theft model that he's really talking about. Does I understand have a point the point in terms of, of, of their content, newspaper content, and others being online and not I being paid do. for. And of course, I mean, newspapers have just, uh, the, ho the horse has bolted in that sense. I mean, they opened the door, gave away their content, and then were amazed when they weren't making any money. I never understood that theory in the beginning at all. I think is it possible to reverse it, do you think? Well, I think the, the test is... Will people it, pay for online content? Yeah, here's the question. If Rupert Murdoch does, as, he, as he's doing now, create in the Wall Street Journal a first-class newspaper, there's no doubt about it, it's a first-class newspaper, and he and his editor have done that. And if people find things of unique value there, they will be prepared to pay. Just as people come to your beast because you have unique things there. When Christopher Buckley leaves the Republican Party, that's unique to you. People would have been prepared to pay. You were letting them have it free. And I think that's right, especially as you build up the business. Harry, I want to ask you, I want to go back to your early days. When you were a kid, and it's documented in your book, it's a beautiful story of when you were some 12 years old, and it was that terrible evacuation of the defeat from Dunkirk. What did you see on the beaches of England? Well, I was a kid of 12, and I wanted to build a sand wall to keep the Irish Sea out, and the Irish too, if we could, uh, because they used to take too many deck chairs on the beach. <laughs> and my father insisted we went for a walk, and then I saw these men just lying. Small all beyond the pier, m totally inert. As if they were I would dead. have thought they're homeless. Why doesn't somebody take them to a shelter? But they weren't. They were soldiers who the day before had been pounded on the beaches of France by Stuka dive bombers, the German panzers closing in, and they were... My father squatted on his haunches, gave them a... My father was 39, then a Stoke locomotive engineer, uh, and talked to them, and he, and he did something I should have done. I was, I was so irritated. He was talking to these men. He did something I should have done, ask questions, listen, listen. Then when he came back, he reported to the people in the boarding house what Dunkirk had really been like and why the men felt betrayed. You didn't find it in a newspaper anywhere. What the newspaper headlines were were, bloody marvellous, our troops can't wait to get back. It was a total lie. And it was a, yeah, a, a lie total and lie, a but that made me think about journalism. I realised that it was necessary to keep up people's morale. And, and Tina knew my dad, and he was sort of so blunt and forthright. Uh, at the same time, I thought that once you start shading the truth in a newspaper, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And the, we were already in trouble. Don't forget, in 1939, the British people and the world had been denied the truth of what was happening in Hitler's Germany. We denied the truth that Britain was almost defenseless. So Harry Tina is pointing to the indispensable role of, of just basic reporting and basic truth through journalism. Well, never being f believing what you're fed without questioning. And I think it's very difficult, particularly for journalists. Uh, you know, we're always hearing about how difficult it is for people in pr uh, public life now to deal with the media. But how about how difficult it is for the media to deal with politi politicians now who are so canned, so on message, Good. so utterly fed Absolutely with right. the party line. They never speak truth to journalists at all. I mean, frankly, it's just one big spin machine out Quite there. Quite right. It and to, it's very difficult to, to, get any to get anyone in public life to actually speak candidly about... Do you about think we're totally too right. celebrity focused? Are we too struck by the trappings of power and fame? Well, I have to say that I think that 
particularly during the lead up to Iraq, I mean, people just fell on the floor and slobbered over the Bush administration in ways that were just appalling. I mean, there's something, you know, for us, you know, as, as, a, as a profession for, to be forever ashamed. And I think that a lot of that's about the power of access. It's about the desire to kind of get those cameras in, you know, and if you get shut out, it's like you failed. Well, let me ask you, because obviously your papers, your magazines have been fairly celebrity dominated, and you seem to be having an evolution of your thoughts, of your journalism. Tell me. Well, I have to say that I think, uh, actually, when we began Vanity Fair and the celebrity covers, they actually did give us access and gave us you a interviews. Fest, so, oh, yeah, we did. And we did a lot of hard reporting in Vanity Fair. I always regarded the celebrities as the packaging. I mean, we did terrific pieces, you know, by people like uh, uh, T.D. Olman and, 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 and Alex Shumatov and so on, reporting on, you know, Haiti and, and Noriega and all those stories that we did that and were the, hard, the the hard things. Jungle. I mean, we'd, we've done a lot of investigation at, at Vanity Fair, and the, and the covers were the way in. But I think, I mean, I just would bother now with doing that kind of uh, celebrity interviewing where you just simply everything's set up in a hotel room and you get two hours of it. it's just a waste of time you're better off with a smart piece we do a lot of commentary now that's really well informed from the inside of, uh, uh, of, of the belt you know that the whole political spectrum where people are actually only writing if they have something to say obviously one of the most famous covers we saw it in that piece was the Demi Moore pregnant nude cover yes is that even relevant these days? I mean, was that it just of its a, moment? That cover was a wonderful breakthrough cover. No one had shown a pregnant woman's stomach on a cover before with a celebrity. I was pregnant at the time and I felt rebellious. I felt I'm tired of, of you know, dressing in maternity clothes. Let's just let it all hang out. That was a blow for women. That's my I'm point. very, very proud of that cover. <laughs> well, you're, you, you're, in your book, you say you fell in love with Tina because of what? Well, First of all, she was quite brilliant, of course, and she made me laugh like a lot, like she did when she writes today. She can make people laugh. And she was very brave and very passionate about journalism, about wanting to write things, and that made me... I also stalked him. <laughs> you stalked him? <laughs> she did. Yeah, I mean, Harry was such a glamorous journalist. I mean, I was in love with journalism from the age of 12, so for me to see Harry in action, when Harry was doing the front page, I first saw, walked in and saw Harry laying out the front page of the Sunday Times. I mean, it was like watching Nijinsky dance, as far as I was concerned, in terms of newspapers. And I've always, my biggest regret really was, was that I haven't been, you know, uh, able to work for him on a newspaper well, in like America. To, I'd like to work for you on the beast. Please take, <laughs> please take me on the beast. <laughs> I want to work for him in a heartbeat. So you love this so much. Oh, you yeah. You love each other so much. Yeah. Where is journalism going? Are we going to love what we do in the next several years? Yes, we are, because in many ways it's the golden age because we can retrieve a lot of information. Can't retrieve understanding. And a lot of information has to be dug for. But, for instance, the other day I, I was asked by The Guardian to write on the Gaza war, so I wanted the Goldstone report. I didn't have to walk down to the UN. Bang, 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 I called it up on my and then I knew what I wanted and believed about the 500 pages of book. It's fantastic. What would you tell young people today who ask, I'm sure you, they ask me all the time, how can we get into journalism? It's so difficult today. How can we do what you do? What would you tell them? Uh, first of all, admit ignorance and therefore inflame your curiosity. And if your curiosity is inflamed when you ask questions like, why have we still got 10% unemployed people. Why? What's happening? What's happening to the loans? What's happening to small businesses? And then try and find an answer. And then go to somebody like Tin and say, I have a piece. I think this is missing in the small business puzzle. This is why people are not being taken on. Would you like a piece? Would you like that piece, Tina? Oh, what would you tell them, Tina? I would say write it immediately. Uh, and I'll pay something for it, not as much as I would have paid if I'd been Harry at the Sunday Times, but at least it's a great foot in. Um, I do think that uh, what Harry said is absolutely right. So many young journalists are not actually going in with a question and a desire to have it answered. That is the best way to get published, is to actually supply an answer from shoe leather reporting. And I don't think there's an editor around who's going to say no to it. That's right. Uh, great. Don't, don't think you're going to be a great writer. Find things out. Find out, find out, find out, find out. And on that note, thank you both so much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. And I hope young people are listening because it's a great profession as they know. Join